Mucociliary clearance is an important part of our respiratory defense mechanism. This mucus transport system clears foreign particles and bacteria from the airways. Over the next 20 minutes, we will see, in video recorded by Dr. Stanislav Tatkov, how this important mechanism is affected by temperature and humidity. But let's begin by reviewing where mucus clearance fits into the human respiratory system. Every day we breathe in more than 15,000 liters of air, enough to fill around 1,600 balloons. Even in the most pristine environments, that air is not clean and pure. We inhale thousands of dust, smoke, and virus particles, about 100 bacteria alone every minute. More than 150,000 contaminants each day that, if given free reign, can infect and clog the respiratory system. These foreign particles, viruses, and bacteria are trapped in an extremely sticky mucus layer lining the airways. Mucus carries the trapped material into the larynx in a process known as mucociliary clearance. The physiology of this clearance process isn't completely understood yet, research continues, but let's take a close look at what we do know. We know that mucus transport to clear foreign particles is driven by motel cilia. Cilia are small, tentacle-like structures with a diameter about 1,000 times smaller than a human hair, which beat in an asymmetric rhythm. Cilia protrude from most of the epithelial cells lining the airways, densely carpeting the respiratory tract. This was first revealed by scanning electron microscope images. The cilia are bathed in a watery fluid. The mucus layer, which traps debris, floats on top of this periciliary fluid and, as the cilia beat synchronously, the mucus layer moves, carrying along trapped particles. Now, the exact mechanism by which the cilia cause the mucus to move remains unclear, and it's the subject of intense research. This particular animation is based on the work of Gaber and Pryl. The cilia are shown here in slow motion. In a healthy person, they beat much faster, typically around 15 cycles every second, propelling the mucus about 10 millimeters every minute. Zooming out to a video microscopy recording of live tracheal tissue, you can see the tiny beating cilia as flicker throughout the image and debris floating on the mucus layer as dark spots moving slowly across the field. This computer model, created by Dr. Marin Taufai from Auckland University's Bioengineering Institute, illustrates the temperature changes in the lung during respiration. Airway temperature is mapped to color from 34 in blue to 37 degrees Celsius in red. Inhaled room air is warmed and humidified in the airways. As you can see in the model, by the time it reaches the trachea, room air has warmed significantly. Heat exchange occurs in the airways, so temperature falls during inspiration and rises during expiration as heat and moisture are recovered. In healthy individuals, this physiological mechanism maintains thermodynamic balance, conditioning the inspired air and preventing mucus from drying out. This is important because, as we shall see shortly, mucociliary clearance fails when the mucus dries out. Recovery of heat and moisture during expiration may be inadequate to prevent dehydration of airway mucus in patients suffering from COPD, bronchiectasis, cystic fibrosis, and asthma.
mucus clearance slows dramatically in these patients. During mechanical ventilation with room air, or bypass of the upper airway by tracheostomy, cool, dry, unconditioned air desiccates the airway mucus. Again, mucociliary clearance breaks down through the dehydration of the mucus. Viscous mucus accumulates in the airways. Coughing, a backup mechanism for clearing mucus, increases to try to clear the buildup. Inspired air, heated to body temperature and fully humidified, restores the physiological equilibrium, increasing mucociliary transport and reducing the need to cough. Let's move now on to the experimental results, which show, with video microscopy, mucus clearance on live sheep trachea under a variety of temperature and humidity conditions. The impact of reduced temperature and humidity on mucociliary transport is shown very clearly in this experiment, which compares the behavior of two tracheal samples. The first, on the left, is at normal humidity. The second, at slightly reduced humidity, 90% only 10% below normal. Size is indicated by this scale. You will see that when the relative humidity of air flowing over the trachea is below 100% for a long period, the mucus layer will dry out. Of course, this prevents proper mucociliary transport, leaving potentially infectious debris stuck in the airway. For both recordings, the air was supplied at 25 liters per minute and 38 degrees Celsius from the humidifier. For simplicity, unidirectional airflow has been used in all the demonstrations. As we mentioned earlier, heat and water vapor are normally partially recovered during expiration. As the clip starts, the right trachea has been exposed to a constant airflow at lower humidity for 15 minutes. Although you can see tiny beating cilia flickering in the background of both clips at this stage, debris in the mucus of the right clip are stationary. Mucus transport is essentially stopped. The dark spots, moving quickly across the left clip now, show debris being cleared by effective mucociliary transport. After only an hour at the lower humidity, the mucus layer at the right has completely dried out. The clip is quite short, so let's play it again. Remember the right trachea has been exposed to 90% humidity for only 15 minutes. Then after an hour, it has dried out completely. Any debris will remain stuck on the trachea and may lead to infection. Right, let's take a look at how the measurements were made. This diagram illustrates the experimental setup schematically. Live tracheal tissue from a sheep was mounted in a tissue bath. Using the tissue bath, we could control the flow, temperature, and humidity of air passing over the trachea to simulate different environments. In the middle of the photograph, you can see the actual tissue bath that was used. We obtained sheep trachea tissue from an abattoir. The base of the bath simulated normal physiological conditions to maintain the live sample. We kept the bath at a normal body temperature for a sheep, 38 degrees Celsius, that's 100 degrees Fahrenheit. A humidifier supplied a unidirectional airflow over the mucus layer sitting on the epithelial or outer surface of the trachea. During the experiment, temperature and humidity of the air supplied by the humidifier were varied between normal body and typical room environments. Normal body conditions for a sheep trachea were taken as 38 degrees Celsius, 100% relative humidity. And we used 24 degrees, that's 75 degrees Fahrenheit, and 60% humidity as our typical room air environment. We observed the trachea sample with a microscope through a heated glass window in the top of the tissue bath. A high-speed digital camera connected to the microscope let us record the beating cilia and mucociliary transport of debris caught in the mucus layer that you can see in this video. The experimental setup let us show you real-time measurements 
as the temperature and humidity of air flowing over the trachea were changed at the humidifier. In the first experiment, we showed that a constant flow of air, even at 90% humidity, can dry out the mucus layer. This next experiment shows that brief exposure to room air inhibits mucociliary clearance, but demonstrates humidified air can restore the mucociliary mechanism. Here we are monitoring the velocity of debris on the mucous surface as it is pushed along by mucociliary transport. The scale, which is 200 microns long, indicates magnification. This tissue has been exposed to unidirectional airflow at 38 degrees Celsius, 100% relative humidity for some time, so mucus transport is operating normally. Just after recording began, temperature and humidity were reduced to typical room conditions. Transport velocity slows until the debris on the mucus layer stops moving almost completely. Transport velocity is restored when we return to body temperature and humidity. Particles on the surface are moving at about 8 millimeters per minute. Let's rewind and replay the video, but plot the velocity, temperature, and humidity on the graph. Mucus velocity is in yellow, temperature in orange, and humidity in blue. You can see the drop in temperature and humidity quickly causes a drop in transport velocity. Transport velocity is restored when temperature and humidity return to normal. To show that the reaction of mucus transport is repeatable, the previous experiment was duplicated with several temperature-humidity cycles. The first two are shown here. As you will see, mucus transport velocity consistently followed the temperature and humidity changes. Again, mucus velocity, the air temperature, humidity, and flow rate are shown graphically. When the clip starts, the airflow is at body temperature and humidity. We'll drop it to typical room conditions. As before, Mucus velocity drops too. Returning airflow to body conditions, we see the surface debris begins moving again. Mucus transport stops when the temperature and humidity are dropped for a second time. Notice how cilia in the shallower portions of the trachea stop beating. The next clip will focus on cilia beat activity. The mucus transport velocity is plotted against time in this graph, showing the two cycles from the video recording. Adding temperature in orange and relative humidity in blue on the right-hand scale illustrates their link to mucus velocity. Notice how the transport velocity responds to changes in temperature and humidity within a few seconds. Mucus velocity quickly reaches zero soon after the drop to room temperature. However, transport velocity recovers more slowly when physiological conditions are restored. It takes some time to rewarm and rehydrate the mucus layer. In the previous clips, we have explored how unconditioned room air inhibits mucus transport. In this video, we will focus on the motile cilia, the tentacle-like structures lining the airways that were shown in slow motion during the introduction. Recall that it is their activity that leads to mucus transport. Normally, cilia beat in unison to move debris in the mucus. But like mucus transport itself, this video shows their activity is affected by temperature and humidity too. The cilia motion has been calculated using Fourier time series analysis of this region of the video. The cilia beat frequency was estimated from the power spectrum density calculated over one second intervals and is shown on the indicator. High frequencies show the cilia are working effectively to clear foreign material from the trachea.
Low frequencies indicate the cilia are barely moving. As before, temperature, humidity, and airflow are displayed. Initially operating at about 12 beats per second, cilia activity quickly drops when temperature and humidity are reduced. Activity is restored when we return to physiologically normal conditions. This waterfall plot shows the power spectrum density calculated from the video. Our estimate of the cilia beat frequency is marked in black. Frequency is plotted vertically with high activity in red and low activity in blue.